In order to achieve the desired didactic effect, I soon realized that I would have to get help from experts in the field. So I asked 11 of my dear friends who immediately responded to my appeal, dedicating an endless number of hours to the project and letting themselves be tormented by my infinite needs as an editor. They could not have given me a more valid testimony of their friendship. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You will meet them all during this presentation, each with their own editorial style, but all motivated by the desire to share their knowledge. The study of mirror cells may seem difficult and hostile, but we want to take you by the hand and lead you to the discovery of this fascinating biochemical laboratory that allows us to illuminate the knowledge of macular edema by an unexpected light. No work on the Mueller cells could abstract from the fundamental and inspiring work of Andreas Reichenbach and Andreas Brinkmann, veritable popes of the Mueller cells. An endless thank you to them for what they have brought to science. Long considered only as a glial cell of mechanical support to the retinal neurons, MGSCs is also a fascinating biochemical laboratory indispensable for the maintenance of homeostasis and hydration of the retina. Its role in the pathogenesis of macular edema is primordial. Since Mueller cells are the only type of cells that extend over the entire thickness of the retina, and have contact with practically every type of cell, its positioning is strategic to carry out a very wide range of functions essential for the maintenance of a retinal homeostasis. To start with the historical part of Mueller's cell research, let me now introduce you my professor of ophthalmology, Peter Leuenberger, with whom I worked for seven years in Geneva. Peter is former professor of ophthalmology of the University Hospitals in Geneva and has worked at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He founded the Cell Research Laboratory of the Ophthalmology Clinic in the city of Calvin and published in the 2000s some fundamental works on retinal glia in diabetes. The word to you, Peter. Elisabetta is a great researcher that I have known for 37 years. Biologist by training, she has published numerous works mentioned above, which are continuously evoked in this presentation. She has always collaborated with Professor Leuenberger, and with her knowledge, she has made possible the brilliant insight that emerged from the Geneva Laboratory. Hi, I'm Peter Leuenberger, and in the late 60s, I had the possibility to animate the Biocellular Basic Research Laboratory at Geneva University Eye Clinic. 20 years ago, our main interest were investigations on the retinal glia. This gave birth to different papers the content of which I will be relating to you now. 
when performing cell biological studies on retinas of experimental animals in the framework of experimental diabetes, obesity, hypertension with vasculopathies at AIM in the 70s and 80s, we got aware that very early on in the history of these pathologies, long before the appearance of early clinical signs of whatever vessel disease, the earliest signs of pathological changes were observed in the glial compartment of the functional unity retina pigment epithelium and only later on in the purely neuronal compartment. In the 80s and 90s, we got more and more aware of it, and in particular of the fact that the observed changes in glial cells precede by far the apparition of early clinical symptoms like microhemorrhages, hyperpermeability of the barrier, be it retinal vascular as well as Bruch's membranes, etc. The changes in glial behavior, Müller cells, astroglia and microglia were massive with glycogen accumulation, microfibrillar and microtubular changes, etc. With the introduction of cytochemical and cytogenetic methods, much more evidence and knowledge was gathered, allowing better understanding of possible therapeutic approaches. And by the change of the century came the gradual introduction and development of OCT with far better resolution of the clinical investigations. When we think about the embryogenesis and composition of retina and pigment epithelium, we must keep in mind that the visual organ is not an exclusive compartment of central nervous system stretched out to the orbital periphery, but has been further developed by contacts with neuroectoderm, mesoderm, and finally also ectoderm. Müller cells have first been described in quite some detail by Professor Heinrich Müller from Würzburg in 1856 and further on. They were considered as Stützzellen, holding together the complex neuronal structure containing mostly lipids and hardly any collagen in their three-dimensional composure. This glial support is present from sector 3 to sector 9 in this drawing. The glial cells reached from the internal limiting membrane which they produce and maintain to the external limiting membrane formed by the cell membranes of the photoreceptor inner segments. We have learned and understood that they assure three-dimensional support and cohesion, but in addition sustain also transport, permeability and metabolism. In flat mount retina, we can demonstrate via scanning electron microscopy, Müller cells and astrocytes thanks to glial fibrillar acidic protein GFAP. Microglial cells are marked by isolectin B4 peroxidase. Vascular permeability is correlated to endothelial cells and the tightness of their tight junctions, regulated 
by the vascular permeability factor that was the first factor detected in the anti-VEGF agents in the mid-90s. You can see the extravasations in the pictures B and C. The immunofluorescence of staining is considered as partial parasite or microglial dysfunction. Diabetic retinopathy is a low-grade inflammatory disease. The slide shows extravasation in diabetic rats 15 days after introduction of diabetes. Muller cell density is increased early in diabetic rats, already from the fourth week on. In diabetic retinopathy, we find glial activation with alpha actin depletion, red, and GFAP green increase together with disintegration of macro of macrofibular elements. And now a very important slide about astrocytes and some working hypothesis. Astrocytes are diminished in the central and peripheral areas, less so in the mid periphery. It may be indicative for the regional differences in vascular pathology in central, peripheral and pericentral areas that we find regularly in cases of diabetic retinopathy. In 1999, we could demonstrate that microglial cells increase in density after four weeks of diabetes and hypertension, showing the additive effect of these two diseases on the severeness of vascular alterations. The vitreous interface becomes an important object of investigation and a potential interactor in case of pathological events. Slit lamp bio microscopy, contact lens, and OCT are much more reliable than angiography for the correct therapeutic decision. In the presence of epiretinal membranes with traction and or contraction, this has to be removed. If there is edema. This has to be treated in beforehand with anti-VEGF and or steroids. In this table, a very schematic outline of the different therapeutic possibilities that we have to evaluate. In case of macular edema, we must elucidate its causes with morphological and biochemical analysis, as demonstrated elsewhere in this work to find out the best treatment option. In case of diabetic focal retinal alteration, the laser treatment remains secure of choice due to the well-demonstrated increase of pre-retinal PO2. The more the glycosylation of hemoglobin is elevated, the more its oxygen transport and release capacity is diminished. <coughs> Finally, we should never neglect 
that arterial hypertension remains a most important triggering factor of a whole cascade of deleterious biochemical events. Dr. Vujosevic, who works at St. Joseph's Hospital in Milan, has been involved in research on diabetic retinopathy for years, both on a biochemical and clinical level. Her presentation underlines for all of us the fundamental importance of glial fibrillary acid protein as a marker of the glial inflammatory reaction, and she then goes into clinical analysis with OCT and the benefits of various specific treatments. Let us now give her the floor in this very clear presentation. Hello, I'm Stella Vujosevic from San Giuseppe Hospital in Milano, Italy and I will talk to you today about the clinical evaluation of Müller cells in diabetes mellitus. So Müller cells are very long cells in the retina and they extend from the inner limiting membrane to the outer limiting membrane. They have numerous functions, such as the metabolic support and uh, nutrition of neurons. They are fundamental in the homeostasis of water and potassium. They participate in the protection against oxidative stress and contribute to neuronal signaling and also to recycling of photopigments. They participate in the release of neuroactive and vasoactive substances. Mueller cells are considered to be the communicator cells between the vessels and neurons. And in diabetes mellitus, there is an upregulation of GFAP and aquaporin-4 uh, there is more proliferation than apoptosis of the Miller cells. Uh, then there is an increase in the release of VEGF and metalloproteinases and decrease in the release of PDF. And also their role in the maintenance of the normal function of the blood retinal barrier is altered. So in chronic hyperglycemia, glial cells are precociously affected. And when we say glial cells, we think about both the microglial cells, so the Mueller cells and the astrocytes, and also the microglial cells. So the Mueller cells react to a hyperglycemic condition by facing a reactive gliosis, a process which is characterized by three non-specific responses, such as the hypertrophy, the cellular proliferation, and an increase in intermediate filament proteins such as the nestin, vimentin, and GFAP, or glial fibrillary acidic protein. In normal subjects, so non-diabetic subjects, the GFAP is prevalently expressed by retinal astrocytes, and it is therefore detectable only in the retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer, while it is absent in Mueller cells. And the increase in GFAP is considered a common marker of reactive gli gliosis in Mueller cells in diabetes mellitus. Not only there is an overexpression of GFAP uh, in diabetes mellitus, but there is also the overexpression of aquaporin-4 and aquaporin-1 uh, as the signs of glial activation. In fact, in a study that we performed several years ago, we found a significant increase in GFAP concentration in the aqueous humor of diabetic patients with initial signs of diabetic retinopathy versus non-diabetic subjects, and also the increase of aquaporin-4 concentration even in diabetic patients without clinical signs of diabetic retinopathy. In more advanced stages of diabetic retinopathy, such as the presence of diabetic macular edema, the GFAP concentration is increased, but then if these patients are treated with the subthreshold micropass laser, there is a decrease of GFAP concentration in the aqueous humor one year after the treatment. And also there is a decrease in VEGF concentration and Q 
KIR 4.1 concentration, which is the inwardly rectifying potassium channel and which controls the potassium concentration across the cellular membrane and influences simultaneous water transport. From clinical point of view, the activation of the glial cells in the retina in diabetes mellitus can be easily evaluated by using spectral domain OCT. Because the spectral domain OCT uh, can easily show us the morphology and also the thickness of single retinal layers. In fact, uh, we evaluated the single retinal layer thickness in both the macular and peripapillary region of patients with and without clinical signs of diabetic retinopathy. And we found that there was a significant decrease in the retinal nerve, uh, layer, uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness uh, in these patients as a sign of neurodegeneration in the retina. And also we found a significant increase in the inner nuclear layer thickness in patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy versus control as the sign of the activation of the Müller cells because in the inner nuclear layer, the nuclei of the Müller cells are located. Also in patients with diabetic macular edema, when they are treated with uh, subtracial micropass laser treatment, a decrease in the inner nuclear layer thickness is uh, observed one year after the treatment. So the changes in both the microvascular components and glial components in diabetic macular edema, for example, can be easily evaluated if we use non-invasive imaging modalities, such as, for example, the OCT and OCTA. If you look at this case, this is a case of cystoid diabetic macular edema. You can see both the OCT and OCTA images, and the patient was treated with subthreshold micropulse laser. You can see that after three and six months, there is a decrease in the cysts and also in the retinal thickness. But what was more curious was the decrease in the number of microaneurysms, both in the superficial and deep capillary plexus, especially the decrease in the number of microaneurysms was more precocious uh, in deep capillary plexus, even at three months after the treatment. And why this decrease specifically in the deep capillary plexus? We know that the Müller cells uh, nuclei are located in the inner nuclear layer and that there is a tight connection between the Müller cells and the deep capillary plexus. And the Müller cells and feed control the blood retinal barrier properties at the level of the intermediate and deep capillary plexus, which are located in the inner nuclear layers, in response to changes in neuronal activity. So changes in morphology or function of Müller cells can induce also the changes in the deep capillary plexus, which can be easily detected on OCTA images. Another uh, confirmation of the changes uh, of the glial component uh, in macular edema was found in our recent study where we evaluated a specific pattern of diabetic macular edema. So it was diabetic macular edema with subforeigner retinal detachment. And these patients were treated either with the anti-VGF treatment or with intravitreal steroids. What we found? We found when evaluating different uh, biomarkers of inflammation or glial activation uh, in these patients, that there was a significant decrease in the drill extension. Drill is the disorganization of the inner uh, retinal layers after the desametasone treatment. And that also that there was a significant improvement. So it means the decrease in number of hyperreflective retinal spots, which are the sign of the activated microglial cells. And then uh, uh, when we uh, were thinking why it happened, uh, why there was a decrease in the uh, drill extension after the desametasone treatment and not after the anti-VGF treatment, 
we found some responses also in the previous experimental studies uh, which reported in vivo the activation of glucocorticoid receptors in Müller glia that is protective to retinal neurons by modulating levels of inflammatory cytokines that suppress microglial reactivity. And steroid treatment, in this case in particular the zamethasone treatment, can promote neuronal survival by suppressing microglial reactivity. So this data may help in further study of non-invasive imaging biomarkers that can be easily detected by OCT and OCTA, the biomarkers of glial um, activation, for better evaluation of treatment response. And with this I have finished and I thank you all very much.